Will the British monarchy disappear? On the morning of April 9th, 2021, news of Prince Philip's death at the age of 99 broke. He was Queen Elizabeth's husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, and he died at Windsor Castle just two months before his birthday. This year, the British royal family made one headline after another. In early March, Prince Harry and his wife Meghan Markle stirred up a buzz when millions around the world listened to them complain of being fed up with living in the British royal family ever since Meghan upgraded her status from divorcee to duchess. Her husband Prince Harry is the second son of Prince Charles and the grandson of Prince Philip. We have no idea if his grandfather's passing had anything to do with the hard time the royal family experienced from Harry and Meghan's drama, but there have been heated discussions in the media. Many are also wondering if the British monarchy will survive or whether it should continue to exist in the 21st century. Let's first have a brief look at Prince Philip's life and the British royal family before reviewing the outlook of the situation. Though born a prince of Greece and Denmark on the Greek island of Corfu in 1921, Prince Philip did not have an easy childhood. While he was still an infant, a Greek revolution overthrew the monarchy and forced the family of seven to flee Greece. They lived an impoverished life in exile in a house provided by a relative on the outskirts of Paris. At the age of nine, Prince Philip's father abandoned the family. His mother suffered a nervous breakdown and had to spend many years in mental facilities. Eventually, Prince Philip went to live with relatives in England before being sent to boarding school in Scotland. After his school years, he attended the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. It was there that he met then Princess Elizabeth, the future queen, during a visit by the royal family in 1939. In 1940, Prince Philip joined the Royal Navy, serving in the Mediterranean and the Pacific during World War II. In 1942, at the age of 21, he was one of the youngest officers ever named first lieutenant and second in command of a destroyer. Toward the end of the war, Prince Philip began courting Princess Elizabeth. They got married in 1947 and Prince Philip became a naturalized British citizen. He was also named Duke of Edinburgh. In 1952, Elizabeth became queen and Prince Philip started his full-time royal duties, serving as his wife's consort. He knelt before her and swore to be her loyal follower. I, Philip, will become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. Faith and truth I will bear unto you, to live and die, against all manner of folks, so help me God. And as patron to charitable organizations. As the royal family has shed most of its political powers, Queen Elizabeth, Prince Philip, and their children took on roles with various charities. The Queen herself is the titular patron of over 600 charities, although this role consists mostly of drawing attention to the organization's causes. Prince Philip earned the affection of generations here in the United Kingdom, across the Commonwealth, and around the world. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said, highlighting his work on behalf of numerous charities. Speaking of the British royal family, Queen Elizabeth is one of the most famous and admired people on earth. She is the head of state, but with respect to political matters, she has to remain strictly neutral. The Queen has an important formal and ceremonial relationship with Parliament, and her most important role is granting royal assent to bills passed by Parliament in order for them to become law. In theory, the monarch can choose whether or not to sign a bill, but such royal assent has never been refused since 1707, and the role has become largely symbolic. Nevertheless, the Queen can still indirectly exercise her influence on British politics through the Parliament. The Parliament consists of the Sovereign, the House of Lords, and the House of Commons. Members of the House of Lords are drawn from the peerage, and peerages are created by the Queen. The Queen can change the composition of the House of Lords by ennobling peers. Though the House of Lords does not have the power to reject a bill passed by the House of Commons, most bills can be delayed for up to one year, except the money bill. For a bill that is time-sensitive, the delay could mean an effective rejection. The British Crown has shown great caution in this regard, and it is customary not to use these channels of political intervention, as that could create a constitutional crisis and jeopardize the existence of the monarchy itself. This is not absolute, though. Take the case of the U.S. Democratic Party's H.R. 1 bill, which imposes sweeping changes to the electoral rules, as an example. 
under a constitutional monarchy, something so controversial that could lead to a fundamental shift in the fate of the country might convince the monarch to go out of his way not to sign it, forcing the political parties to sit down, compromise with each other, and reconsider a solution. In this approach, the monarch acts as a buffer layer to keep the struggle between political parties within certain limits and not past the bottom line. Without this buffer, the result could be a deadly struggle between rival factions, leading to society being further torn apart. In other words, at critical moments, the presence of the monarch is like a sedative that can help maintain stability and facilitate reaching a social consensus. From this perspective, the constitutional monarchy has its advantages, with its intrinsic value of the capacity to cope with crises. This is similar to the mechanism of a certain segment of a gene in an organism whose function may not be expressed explicitly, but may offer advantages to species for survival when faced with an extreme natural disaster. The UK, Canada, and Australia are all constitutional democracies. They each have Queen Elizabeth as their monarch. In these countries, change of ruling power among political parties usually causes less turmoil than in other democracies. For example, every time there's a change of ruling party in the United States, the volume of inquiries about immigrating to Canada will rapidly peak. There are always people proclaiming, I don't want to be an American anymore, I want to immigrate to Canada. Last year, a rumor circulated online that if Trump were re-elected, even Obama would want to immigrate to Canada. A few years back, when Trump was first elected in 2016, many American leftists couldn't accept it, saying they couldn't stay in the U.S. anymore. A British newspaper even mocked these complaints, asking if they regretted American independence and wanted to return to the British Empire. However, Canadians rarely want to immigrate to the United States because of a political party turnover. Of course, there are always many Canadians moving to the United States, generally for economic or career reasons, but rarely do they leave Canada over emotional reactions to political change. So can monarchies still survive in the 21st century? If we look at history since the 20th century, it is safe to say that all the European monarchies we know will be disappearing. The First World War brought a great collapse of European monarchies. Old kingdoms and empires went to their graves along with the war. The Hohenzollern dynasty of the German Empire was overthrown by a revolution, while the Habsburg dynasty of Austria was disintegrated after the defeat of the war and replaced with a republic. The worst was the Romanov dynasty in Russia, where Lenin ordered, after the October Revolution, that the imprisoned Tsar and his family must all be killed. Nicholas was killed instantly followed by Alexandra Fyodorovna and the servants, then Alexei. Ottoman Turkey also collapsed into a republic after World War I. The Eastern European countries within the communist sphere of influence also abolished their monarchies after World War II, including Yugoslavia in 1945, Bulgaria in 1946, and Romania in 1947. In Greece, after fighting armed communists for three years, the conservative forces finally won and were able to retain their monarchy. As such, the 20th century saw a series of great social upheavals. First, it was a world war, followed by the Great Depression, then another world war, and finally the communist movement, which resulted in revolutions that ended many monarchies in Europe. The monarchs fell like leaves off of trees in the fall. It can be said that the last century was the twilight of European monarchies. Monarchs that survived the 1960s and 70s have found a way to live with contemporary trends and escape the crisis of revolutionary overthrow, but we can expect them to begin fading away in the 21st century. The simple reality is that monarchs have generally lost their majesty and national reverence. Liu Xihong, the first Chinese diplomat sent to the UK in the 19th century, was a conservative deputy ambassador. He wrote in his diary about what he saw at royal ceremonies and banquets. Everyone toasted the queen first. When the ceremony started, everyone stood up, raised their glasses, and shouted, God bless our queen. Respect for the queen came from the heart. Today, however, the majesty of the royal family has become rather insignificant, although there might still be many people who have fondness for the royal family. The presence of royal members at public events is more often seen as a piece of entertainment news, almost as if they are actors in an elaborate reality show sharing their lives with everyone. 
Royals have to attend various public events with cumbersome etiquette. However, they aren't properly revered, nor is their privacy properly protected, which could all be quite burdensome for them. Contemporary leftist thinking is more focused on the promotion of individuality. The royal manners, lifestyle, and etiquette make these princes and princesses feel more and more restricted and less and less individualistic. With the passage of time, they will become tired of being a member of the royal family. Ultimately, they will put an end to their undesirable status themselves. The British Prince Charles himself is already quite rebellious, not to mention the younger generations. We can imagine how, after the passing of the Queen in the future, the British royal family may quickly disappear. The existence of the constitutional monarchy has its advantages and value, but its demise in the 21st century seems to be certain.